So welcome to this Raising Standards in Tutorial Provision webinar. Um, this is an FETN webinar in association with eMemoir. Uh, today the session is going to be led by Dr. Sally Wooten and Beach Catch Marching. And as ever, we like to keep these sessions as interactive as possible, so feel free to use the question or chat facility at any point throughout the duration. You'll all receive a copy of the video recording the slides, which I'd encourage you to share and to perhaps discuss, open some dialogue with your colleagues. So without further ado, I'm going to mute my microphone and hand over to Sally and Bees. Keep the questions coming, all. Thanks very much, Manic. Good afternoon to everyone and hope everyone's well. Uh, this is the latest in the series of webinars that we're doing. That's myself uh, from eMemoir, and I'm joined again this afternoon by Sally Wooten from FETN. To FETN members, welcome, and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the previous series. If you're new, by the way, and not come across FETN, then welcome to FETN, and there's some opportunity to get more information. As we said, we've got the details, the contact details of Fat Sally uh, at the, on the very last slide. For those that maybe have not met uh, myself, I'm director of eMemoir, uh, 42 years experience in further education, worked in schools, colleges, and the private sector, and now chair of the board of a medium-sized college as well as of uh, chair of a, a private training company. Sally, do you just want to say a few words about yourself? Yes, can do. Thanks, Beige. Um, yep, yeah, I'm Sally Wooten. I'm the founder of the Further Education Tutorial Network. Um, I've been working within tutorial provision for about 30 years now, done some extensive research and developed a, a lot of um, support tools for developing tutorial provision. That's great, Sally. In the course of this afternoon, Sally will be leading on the discussion and please pose your questions, etc. And I'll be monitoring the questions and hopefully interrupting Sally in the nicest possible way <laughs> with a question or comment. Um, but she'll be in charge of the, the slides. And again, just to remind people that listening in, you'll get copies of the recording and slides, uh, if not today, certainly by sometime tomorrow. Sally, would you like to tell us what the aims of this afternoon are? Yes, um, we're, we're going to um, have a, a look around the quality of tutorial provision and just get a sense of what quality looks like um, for, for this area and to see what the inspections are currently saying about areas for improvement and, and then really just exploring some strategies in terms of how we can improve certain aspects, particularly group tutorial and one-to-one -one reviews. So we'll be um, having a, a good look at various aspects. And as you've said before, if anybody's got any questions or any comments, then that will be great as we, as we go along. So first of all, let's start with just a, a little overview from the um, report 31st of August 2020, looking at the state of play really in the quality of provision generally. And I think we can, we can take some positives from looking at personal development and behaviours and attitudes in terms of the uh, outstanding and good. But as we can see, there is, there is still a way to go. And even if we consider that provision can be good, that still means that there are areas for improvement. So um, it's really just about getting a sense that there is work to do. And if we, if we consider um, the little aspects that are pulled out from, from the report, these were the key messages really that, that we were looking at. And some of these we'll be dipping into as we, as we go through this webinar. So all of these things touch on tutorial provision. And I think it's, it's really important if we just consider for a moment the inspection framework and we look at implementation and impact. Now, I, I did like the idea that they brought in this intent and the notion that there are some things, particularly in terms of personal development um, and, and sort of long term behaviours, that we won't necessarily see that impact immediately or even sometimes within the time that students are spending with us, but that there is an intent that we are 
helping to encourage and develop the whole person and aspects of their, of their attitudes and behaviours and their personal social skills. So that intent, I think, is, is a very useful thing to hang on to. In terms of implementation, I've highlighted curriculum delivery here because quite often we forget that tutorial, group tutorial is, is curriculum delivery of a sort. And we often separate out the, what we call teaching and learning and tutorial as two separate things. And I think if we start to think about tutorial curriculum in terms of our group tutorial, it's helpful to see that it does fall into that, that category. And we need to look at the implementation of that curriculum. And then if we come to impact, very much we're looking at progress, knowledge and skills development and destinations within that whole tutorial provision. So we need to just hold in our heads that there is a great impact from tutorial provision and we need to be looking at what we can do to improve that, to improve the whole impact and outcomes for learners. Sally, do you think there's a, a place in that impact also for things like learner attitudes, their, you know, their approach to other people, you know, care, concern? Yes, definitely. And, and, and if, we, if we look at, at this slide now, we can see that under behaviours and attitudes, personal development, we can see the things that, that you're talking about there. It is very much about the whole learner journey, developing that holistic development. It's about looking at the whole person and asking ourselves, what is it that we're really trying to do? for these learners in the time that they spend with us. And it's very much about helping them to recognize and learn about themselves, helping them to prepare for life and work and to understand their attitudes, their beliefs, their behaviors, and, and how that impacts on the way they are in the workplace and, and in the, the social context. So we can, we can see here that, that, again, I've highlighted in blue, all those aspects that are very specifically linked to um, tutorial provision. But I mean, there is a caveat with all of this. It's very important to, to acknowledge that even though these sit within tutorial provision, it's not the whole job for tutorial to look after these things. These should be throughout all of curriculum and we should be embedding these because I think over time, one of the problems with tutorial is it's become very much a dumping ground for anything that's not covered within their vocational or academic curriculum is delivered within tutorial. And I think we need to take a broader perspective on that and to look at how we can embed some of these things across the piece and look at curriculum as a whole experience with some of these things being picked up in tutorial or expanded on the tutorial but often these also sit within that broader curriculum and sally do you think that ofsted have that perception as well when they come in to look at a provider that 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 it should permeate through all aspects of the the curriculum um, you know as you said the vocational and the academic as well Yes, I, I think it is, it is there, but I, I don't think enough attention is really paid to, to how that's done um, and, and what the impact is of that. So I think although, although they are obviously looking at these things, and if you think that behaviours and attitudes and personal development is, is half of the inspection framework, then it's significant that therefore makes tutorial significant, but it's a, but I, I'm not sure how much they pick up on um, how this is embedded within one-to-one -one conversations, for example, or or how these elements are, are contextualized within the learner's um, academic interest or, or vocational interest. So I think I think there's still 
conversations to be had around that. And the other point I just want to make is I haven't highlighted staff development under leadership management, but as we said in, in our previous um, webinar, when we were talking about um, effective recruitment and training, staff development is key to good one-to-one -one tutorials. So we need to be ensuring that that, that is also in place. So this is just a, a snapshot really of, of the framework for tutorial delivery. Now, these will, these will differ to some extent for every organization, how you, how you organize your tutorial provision is, is, is down to many factors. But I think, you know, if we just look at, we've got this group tutorial and this individual tutorial, and you can see that some of the things meet together. So whereas we might be doing um, activities and exercises to develop certain personal social skills under, under a group tutorial um, framework, we should also be having conversations with individuals about these things. So it also sits within that individual review. And then there are certain aspects that, that will be joined or delivered through both individual and group tutorial, particularly supporting transition and progression. So this is just a, a snapshot, if you like, of, of what we need to be doing. And as you can see from this, it's really a complex provision and we, we, we need to be spending time. And one of the things that's worried me over recent years is how the, the, the time allocated to tutorial has really been squeezed and we've now got in a lot of cases, um, I feel inappropriately, but that's a personal opinion, that we've got individual re reviews taking place within a group tutorial setting um, in order to, to save the amount of time that, that, that's spent. And this is a concern that I hear people raise on many occasions is, is the funding and the amount of time that, that we have um, to support tutorial provision. Um, Beej, I'm, if I can pass back to you um, to, to talk about this a little more. Yeah, and I'll pick up a, a question that's come to you as well, Sally. I think, I think uh, Sally's point about um, intent is critical because I think ultimately we're always judged not by intent, although that's important. It's what do we do? What's the practical things we do? What do we implement? And what is the impact on, on the learner experience, whether it be a, a 16 to 18 student on a study programme, an apprentice, an adult returning to learning, you know, uh, uh, someone might, who's coming through an unemployment programme, whatever. So what I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd say, well, one of the things that's critical here is that if you're improving, if you want to improve the quality of tutorial, you actually have to know what resource is available. And for example, if you're relatively new to the sector and you might be involved in managing uh, tutorials or delivering tutorials, I just wanted to use an example of in England of um, how study programmes are funded. You, you, you know, 16, 17 and 18 year olds in a, a college, a school, training provider, local authority um, are funded on the total number of hours they do. And the average number of hours we expect a year is about 600 hours. If you look at the average level of funding for 16, 17 and 18 year olds in England, takes, this takes account of the fact that some will be doing um, programs that are costed a little bit more. So, you know, if you're doing A-levels in humanities, that's costed less than say A-levels in sciences. If you're doing a business studies diploma, then it's costed less than say um, engineering. But let's just assume that, uh, and this was maybe a year ago, the average level of funding was about 4,800 pounds. But that means that for each learner that you have, you're basically earning eight pounds an hour. And, and that's just that simple sum that tells you that, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, 10 learners in a class or 11 learners in a class, that's roughly what the earning is for that number of learners. Now, let's assume, and I'll take a model that Sally's fairly familiar with, I'm familiar with, which is that let's assume that each 16, 17 year old gets 37 hours of tutorial time a year. Let's assume that 34 of that let's assume it's a 34 week uh, program. Let's assume that every learner gets one hour of group tutorial. And then let's assume that over the course of a year, they get three hours of one-to-one. -one. That's on top of the group tutorial. Let's assume that three hours is 
two half hour one to one sessions every term, assuming you're operating a three term year. So if we look at uh, uh, Sixth Form College or in a general FE college, let's just say you've got 2000 eligible uh, 16, 17 year olds. They would mean that potentially drawing down into your institution would be a, a tutorial budget through the formula of £2,296, right? So that's the 37 hours at £8 an hour. That would give you just a tad under £600,000 worth of resource. Now, by the way, if you want to use this, this is a good way of making the case internally in your organisation for the right level of resource to be provided for tutorial. Let's just assume that the total cost of tutorials, therefore, and I'm going to assume quite a large group size, let's assume 20. You could vary this by the number you've actually got in your organization. Let's assume that the average group size for group tutorials is 20, and the average direct cost of putting a tutor, a lecturer, in front of that class outside of London is £50 per hour. That's just simply the direct cost of employing that person. It does not include a contribution towards overhead, such as buildings, uh, marketing, HR, etc. So if you've got uh, an average group size of 20, that means you'd need 100 groups a week. And that would be at £50 per hour. And you've got basically 34 hours over the course of the year. That's going to cost you £170,000. Now, that's got to come from somewhere. So it comes out of basically what you're earning as a potential tutorial budget. The, the most expensive item, as, as we know, because it delivers the biggest outcomes, is the one-to-one -one tutorials, the one-to-one -one review meetings, six of those, half an hour. And let's, let's assume they're all done by lecturers, again, at £50 per hour. Now, you might actually have a different model. You might be using mentors, coaches, etc. So that might mean that the uh, cost per hour is less than £50. You can factor that in. So that's going to cost you 300000 the delivery of the group tutorials 170, your contribution to overheads, the difference between your potential earning through the formula and the costs. And that gives you about 122,000 pound contribution. Now it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 26%. And I certainly know compared to some curriculum areas, that's not bad going. But I, what I want, the point I want to make is that is part of improving the quality. You must make sure you get the light, right level of resource to deliver what your intent is. And I think the other thing that's missing from this equation, Sally, is, of course, if you spend that, it's an investment. Tutorial is an investment. Think about the impacts on those 2000 learners. You're more likely to keep more of them and they're more likely to achieve their learning goals. Now, that's also going to increase that average level of funding, as well as your reputation, as well as outcomes, as well as progression. So it's an investment strategy, which I've just described to you. I don't know if there are any questions specifically about that, but I think that's an important way of Sally of linking what's inside the, uh, uh, the inspection framework, uh, the link between in intention, intent and impact, and also a way of, improve, of, of making sure that you've got the quantity of resource that allows you to deliver a high quality tutorial service. Thanks, Beige. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will be grateful for this because um, arguing the case for um, resources for tutorial provision is, is a really difficult one um, for, for many people. And this will be just so helpful for them. And, it, and it's, it's particularly important what you say about it's an investment. It isn't a cost, it's an investment. And I think we need to be changing the perception of, of what tutorial is about. It's not something that just has to be done because it's part of what we do. It actually has a, it has a service, it has an impact, and it helps us to retain and support our learners. So it, it makes sense to us, I know, and I'll be preaching to the converted. I appreciate that. But I think it's a message that, that we do need to get at. So thanks very much for that. If we, if we just move on then, we're, we're just going to now take a little look at, at, at some of the aspects that need improvement that, that we highlighted at the beginning of this session. So one of these is, is group, group tutorial and, and curriculum design. And there are, there are two standard ways in, in which I've found tutorial curriculum is, is designed. 
One is a kind of pick and mix approach and the other is a very structured approach where you will have um, schemes of work, lesson plans, resources, and these are the weeks that you will do it. Your pick and mix approach gives the tutor more flexibility to deliver um, topics when they might feel it's appropriate. So it might be that there are certain fixed topics that you do throughout the year that, that are timed, and then others are on a, on a, a, a basis of what the students are doing in that particular group at that time and, and what might be appropriate. I think the other, the other thing to, to consider with this is when we were talking earlier about looking holistically at curriculum design and asking ourselves, with all the things that we need to cover, which automatically seem to be put into tutorial curriculum um, around personal social development, for example, what aspects of those naturally occur in the vocational or academic curriculum that a, that a student or a student group is following. So if you're doing something in health and social care around, I don't know, um, healthy eating, for example, would you really want to cover that again in a, in a group tutorial? So it, it, it's about asking ourselves, where do things naturally occur? And how can we create um, a tutorial curriculum that complements what's done within the vocational curriculum and vice versa. So we're looking at the two together so that we're making best use of the time holistically for that curriculum. Sally, have you which with a pick and mix blending through it? Um, yes, and I think what what one or one or two of FETM members have adopted that we did we did a, a whole day's training a, a year or so ago on on this and and I think it's very useful because I wouldn't I wouldn't say one or the other is appropriate it is that combination of the two um, and and also it can it can differ uh, within curriculum areas depending on their approach. I think that the most important thing is that everybody is clear on the purpose of that tutorial curriculum and, and how it's to be developed. And that there is a collaboration between um, vocational academic curriculum and tutorial curriculum to, to make it holistic. The, the actual approach is, is down to the individual organisation. Okay, so if we if we now look um, at, at, at careers, because this is another area that, that needs some improvement, um, and I'm I'm not saying that careers should be um, a part of tutorial curriculum, but the conversation with the learners and the preparation and and, and their individual exploration that leads to career decisions. I think that's really important. And um, I just wanted to flag up for you the blueprint for careers. You, you may already use this, but it, it's really useful in looking at um, how we can help learners to reflect on their personal skills and attitudes, and then how they can plan that within a career context. What do they need to be developing? What are the competencies? Um, what are the attitudes and behaviours? So this is just a, a, a really nice way of looking at that and, and a, a, a very helpful tool for people to use within tutorial with, it, with their students. And is it true, Sally, that, I mean, you've maybe been to a fair number of providers that, you know, if we use the Gatsby benchmarks for careers, yeah. advice and guidance, are you seeing a lot of progress towards those benchmarks? Um, to be perfectly honest, um, I, I, I haven't. I haven't seen a great deal. I think pe people are starting to to adopt that approach, um, and 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 they are they are starting to review their their provision against it and their ways of working against it. 
um, I, d I don't know whether there are there are participants here today that that can talk a little bit more about their experiences perhaps and what on what they're doing or 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 maybe pop their ideas in in chat and where they are at the moment with this mm. and i think it's the point that i think i'm raising here is it's it's not just about complying with the benchmarks or a checklist yeah. as you said it's it's much more fundamental change getting that holistic approach to make sure that careers advice and education permeates everything but as one of the one of, i think it's dave thank you for your comment there that all of this should always be contextualized for the particular sector that the learners you know learning in or going into absolutely it should <clears throat> and 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 it's it's also in the context of tutorial it's about having these conversations within a one-to-one -one. um but, but you're right there is there is this temptation we do it with we do it with Ofsted and inspection uh, we do it with, with gaps Gatsby benchmarks and and, and, and other benchmarks it's almost this tick box exercise mm. do we do this yes we don't ask how well do we do this what is the impact of what we what we do? Could we do it any better? Um, so I, I, I think, you know, benchmarks are useful and I've created them myself for, for various aspects of tutorial provision, but but it's how we use those to to you know to in, to improve what we do that's the most significant thing. And I think in addition, I just something to support what you've just said about career learning competencies that th these should permeate not only through the young person's curriculum, but what about our access students? What about our unemployed students? What about the adults returning to learning? It should permeate through all of those different learning programs. Absolutely. There should be parity across the board. OK. <clears throat> So, so in terms of um, workplace learning, this is this is something else that, you know, within our tutorial, we are supporting learners to to prepare for their work placements and and to prepare them to reflect on the skills and behaviours that they might be developing, and then to help them afterwards to to plan for further progress. So it's about improving the conversation that we have what do we do within group tutorial that helps them to prepare for workplace learning you know what kind of sharing activities do, do we do when students return and and how can we help them to progress and develop those skills um, beyond the workplace learning so this is this is about essentially people going out on work placement but it also relates to apprentices who you know who are who are learning in the workplace um you know on a, on a, a more often basis so th the whole point of this is there is there is within tutorial provision there is this responsibility to work with the individual to make sure that this is purposeful so again we need to look at how we do that and are all these things in place that we're highlighting here i think just to add to that i think my feeling is but we're involved in a kickstart scheme you know to place about three hundred thousand plus unemployed people aged 16 to 24 with employers for six months i think uh, a lot more consideration should be given to the before the during and after uh, learning qualifications aren't mandatory on the program but our concern is that you know the learner or the unemployed learner you know over the six months will not benefit in terms of being able to progress to an apprenticeship or a full-time job without thinking about the before during and after on the kickstart scheme and i think obviously some of the better providers have seen that as being critical uh, i don't know if anyone else is involved in kickstart would see the relevance of what sally's just said in terms of the support and guidance you provide to long-term unemployed on a or those at danger of long-term unemployment on kickstart we're not getting any comments yet <laughs> maybe later okay, okay. thanks okay. tally no problem so so as i say we need to think about these in the in the context of the the one-to-one -one reviews and and how we can help individual learners and and so looking at this this personal tutoring 
role. Um, people often ask me what's the best structure for um, personal tutoring. And it's and it's a it's a really difficult question to answer because it depends on your organization. There isn't a one fits all approach. It depends on on how how you're structured. But these are your considerations. Does it sit within the teaching and learning, or does it sit within student support? Is it centralized, or is it is it managed within departments or academies? Um, a big one is, is it a tutorial team or is it all academic staff? And we still have a mix across the sector of that. And within that, are they full time, fractional or term time only? And that's specifically, you know, looking at, at tutorial teams, we quite often get tutorial teams that are term time only. So it, it's asking yourself all these questions as to what would work best for you. And, and what works best within the within the context of your organisation. And then looking at the tutoring role itself, if we just remind ourselves that these are the things that, that we are trying to achieve through it, and then we'll just break these down a, a, a little bit and look at, first of all, improving the quality of personal support and welfare. And one, one of the questions that I would that I would ask you is, is do all your learners have fair and equitable access to personal support and welfare? Because many different cohorts of students have difficulties accessing the kind of support in a timely manner that they need. Apprentices quite often don't know how to access the support, um, whether to raise it within their or whether in, in their workplace or whether to raise it with, with college, and if so, whom. Um, we have adult learners that quite often can't get access to the welfare or support that they need within a timely manner. It might be that, that you know, they can't, they can't get into college to see somebody, at, you know, in the, in the times that that service is available. Do you do out of hours services for support and welfare? So it's looking at your separate cohorts and asking yourself, if I am this learner, if I am this type of learner, how, how do I access this support? Would it work for me in terms of what we currently offer? Or do we need to be looking at different ways of offering this kind of support? And in your experience, Sally, have you come across some really good examples of how organisations have done that for that breadth of you know, of cohorts? I've, se I've seen examples of out of hours um, support, and I've seen um, some, some flexible um, opportunities for appointments, but even those flexible op opportunities are, are often during the day and not, not everybody can access those. Or it might be that you've got a college with, with three or four sites, and all the support is on one site. So we've got, we've got, you know, sort of different challenges that we need to look at. Even where there are good one-stop shops, if there are still different sites, then even though, you know, we can say that all of, you know, all of our support is one place and we can deal with anything that a learner brings to us, that learner still has to get to that place to be able to do that. So you need to think about how, how people can access it and whether it's appropriate for, for all of your learners. Another th key thing that, that, that comes up quite often is, is the support for tutors. Um, we've just looked at this idea that we provide support and welfare and personal tutors are not experts in these fields and quite often will not be uh, trained counsellors, for example, but they may well be the first person that a student comes to to disclose some distressing information. And when that occurs, we need to have the, the um, support for those tutors to be able to, first of all, understand and deal with 
that situation in, in an appropriate manner, to be able to respond in an appropriate manner, but then also to be able to deal with a, a, any kind of feelings that they might have around that situation as well so i'm not talking about you know with with a counselor you would have you would have regular meetings with a supervisor um to kind of offload if you like i'm not saying that this is what's required but there should be somewhere should a tutor need that kind of support if they've been dealing with a distressing situation so we need to think about how we how we do that and we also need to make sure that our tutors are well informed, that they understand the college's practices and procedures and, and, and how that would work for them. And, and you know, external um, organisations, how they can link up with those. What, what is the boundary of that tutor's role? in terms of referring on internally and externally. So we need training and support around the, this area. And if we, if we think a little bit about um, raising the quality of individual progress reviews through, through observations, for example, then these are some of the aspects that we need to be looking at. And again, I think we've done a, a previous session looking at this in greater detail. Um, but, but just as an overview, you need to be asking yourself, do you look at all these aspects, the preparation, the learning conversation, that, that planning for learning, is that skilled planning for learning? How well are, are the learners engaging in these processes? And how well do we reflect on that progress and encourage the learner to, uh, to move forward? So in, in all of this, um, I'm, I'm quite happy to share the, uh, the, the detailed information on this. And I know that, that quite a few colleges have used this framework, if you like, to, to start to look at their observations of one-to-one -one reviews. Um, and looking at it in this different light. So rather than considering it in terms of a teaching and learning activity, looking at it in terms of the relationship, the learner's level of engagement in that relationship and that conversation, and the skills of the tutor in asking the right questions and facilitating the learner to um, reflect, explore, and make their own decisions for, for um, further development and improvement. So we, we often talk about audit, and I think it's important to look at tutorials in the contents of, are they taking place? I mean, I've been into a, a, a number of organizations and, um, and, and I've run, obs you know, sort of observations for, of one-to-ones and turned up at the room at the time that, that they were planned for and there's been nobody there. And so it's really important, first of all, to make sure that these things are actually happening as scheduled. And then also, is that time being used for its intended purpose? So is it, is it a proper one-to-one -one tutorial or a proper group tutorial? Or you know, is the time spent um, working on uh, assignments or, or trying to develop a vocational skill? Because one-to-one -one tutorial is very specifically about the overview of that learner. So we need to make sure that that's what that time is being used for. A group tutorial, is about that holistic development. It's not about catch up, which, which you know, sort of historically is, uh, uh, has happened a great deal. So we need to make sure that that purpose is there. So all of these things, we need to be asking ourselves questions about, about you know, how well is it happening? Um, is it happening at all, as I've said? And, and then following through these golden threads of safeguarding, quality, diversity, prevent, and ensuring that all of these things are embedded. An observation, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. an, ob an observation here from Beverly. Uh, snapshot 
observations of tutorials are quite stressful and hardly give a full opinion of delivery and reception. Okay, yes, I mean, quite quite often people will say that they're worried because that the, the particular learner that they were working with, you know, was was not engaging well. Um, that there, there are all sorts of circumstances, but but essentially what what we're trying to do is see that those skills for the tutor are there, that um, that the, the learners understand what what the purpose is of the one to one tutorial and that they are engaging in, in that process. I, it, it's like, you know, it's like any kind of observation. Um, if you're observing a, a, a taught lesson, you know, it might just not go well. Sometimes it doesn't, but you still need to get some sense of what's happening. And, and these things don't have to be graded. These are about creating discussions and reflections on what's happening, identifying where areas can be improved, identifying where people might like some support or skills development. So it, I think it, it's more to do with the attitude in which we approach these things. Um, you know, but, but, I, but I do understand perfectly the anxieties around particularly being being observed in, in one to ones but i think we need to make it a supportive a supportive process and another point i think that sally you talked about is about the conversation with uh, with the student about their experience of tutorial but one point i think that we made previously was that you've got to use the language that the student's familiar with not the language of inspection you know Absolutely. Um, so Absolutely. I mean, it's a learning conversation and, and it is just that. It's a conversation. So you, you would speak to people in, in a way that you know they will understand. And, and it's a two way thing. So it's again, it's about the purpose, isn't it? If we come back to what the purpose is, it's, it's about helping that learner. It's about it's about ensuring that, that they've got the skills to reflect and, and to be able to sound out ideas. And I think if we go back to the, what we were talking about before in, in terms of time allocation and resources, it's so difficult to do this if you've got a 15 minute appointment and therefore it becomes five minutes of checking up that they're doing everything that they're meant to be doing five minutes of checking up on whether or not they need any specific help, and then five minutes typing it all up on a computer. So the, the process itself doesn't help. And, 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 you know, I really appreciate that. And I think we need to look at different ways of doing this. But um, in, in, in essence, you know, we just, we, we need to make sure that that relationship and that conversation is helpful to the learner. Yeah, and, and Dave's added a point there about adopting a policy in your organisation where any observation of tutorials conducted within a specified time during that delivery, so that you'll be looking at, for example, the quality of the one-to-one -one conversation. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And everyone, and everyone will know why. That what's the purpose, won't they? Yes, and and coming back to that to that framework I did a couple of slides ago. You know, in reviewing the quality of the in individual progress reviews, I will share that with you because it breaks it down more, and you can see then that that is exactly what it's about. It gives you those things, and and you should be sharing this with you know with your personal tutors so that everybody understands. You know, there should be no mystique around around this. Everybody should understand what it is that we're, that we're looking for. In, in a good one-to-one -one review. And Paula asked a, a question, uh, just before we look at the National Occupational Standards, she asked a question, I think, that we that's certainly been posed before, and I think is one that will come up again frequently. Uh, do you think it's important that staff delivering group tutorials also deliver individual reviews? In this case, a, a, a big caseload of 200 students spread across 13 groups, so there was so little time left for one-to-ones because students are still receiving the progress reviews with course tutors. You know, is, is that the model that you've seen and is that an effective model? 
it, again, it's really difficult to, to comment without, without observing in that organization how that works. Um, the most important thing is to make sure that, that the people doing the one-to-one -one reviews are appropriate, have the right skills and attributes, and that the people that are delivering the group tutorial are, are confident in what they're doing and have the, the, the skills and the knowledge to facilitate that, that activity. Um, they don't necessarily have to be the same people, I wouldn't say, but it, it's very difficult to, to comment um, unless you see, see these things in action, I would say. Uh, but, but Liz adds a point, I think you said, unfortunately, due to time constraints, this is how to one-to-ones often take place that take place inside the group tutorial or you know in a little oh, space sorry. you know okay B sorry I'm, I'm I'm misunderstanding if we're talking about if we're talking about no 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 I think they're two different All two right. different points but I think it's a point you've already referred to about the fact that there's a time constraint and very often the one-to-one -one happens inside a, a group tutorial yeah yeah most definitely and and you know, I've I've seen I've seen this on on many occasions, and it does concern me because if you're not supporting those learners that are doing the what's usually online activities, um, then how do you know that they're learning from those activities? And you know, if you if you're looking at that, then how are you engaging well with a with a one to one and that and that relationship that you're supposed to be engaging in you know at that period of time so yeah to me it is a conflict and 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 as you've shown in the in the funding model it is possible to separate out mm. and for a period of time they were separated out mm. um and, and and i really think that we should go back to that model and i think and in, in addition sally how, didn't we find uh, certainly my experience with our beauty therapist is that during covid with less emphasis on the group tutorial, but more emphasis on the one-to-one. -one. That was the thing that they most valued when they were on remote learning, was the one-to-one -one opportunities that they had frequently with their tutors to talk about personal progress, welfare, well-being, et cetera. Yes, and, it, and, I, and I think it's really interesting that you know people have, have, have started to talk about this because even previous to, to COVID and going online, students were saying that they value the one-to-one -one tutorial um, um, over and above the group tutorial if they had to choose between the two and so i think you know i think we we still undervalue that that one-to-one -one review time and i think you know we should we should be looking at, at ways of, of improving and developing the, the time, the investment that we have in that, because that is the thing that will help learners to, to really focus on, on moving forward. And it gives them time to test out their ideas and to, and to explore their strategies for coping with situations or developing certain skills. And you can't do that in a five to 10 minute conversation. Mm -hmm. So, so th this is the na National Occupational Standards, which I'm sure many of you have, have uh, become quite familiar with now. And um, in, in terms of developing and improving, th this framework can be used in, in many different ways. Um, certainly in, in looking at recruiting personal tutors, but also in, in a broader sense of breaking down the knowledge, the skills, um, performance benchmarks in, in terms of each of these aspects and saying, how well do we do these things? And one, one of the things that we've been currently piloting through FETN, and there's, there's one or two members here today that are engaged in this activity, is looking at the um, professional tutor recognition scheme. And the purpose of this is to enable tutors to reflect on their own practice 
and to put CPD plans in place. Um, and all of these are linked to the national occupational standards. So what we're basically doing is trying to drive up the quality of tutoring across the sector by enabling tutors to reflect on their practice, but then also by recognizing that, because I think it's really important. If you think that we've got QTLS for teaching, um, we've got counseling certificates for counselors, there is nothing up until now that recognizes um, tutoring as a professional um, entity and looking at the skills and the qualities of that. Now the National Occupational Standards outline that. So what this is doing now is it's celebrating the fact that, that tutors are working to those standards. So we've got we've got the three um, the three recognitions. We've got practitioner in tutoring, advanced practitioner in tutoring, and, and leader in tutoring. And you can progress through these, or you can just um, say, you know, at the level that I'm working at now, with my experience, my skills, and what I do, I can, you know, I would like to be recognised as an advanced practitioner or a leader in tutoring. It's not a case that people have to work through the, through the three, but it's also not a case that anybody that's a tutoring practitioner will necessarily um, be accredited with the, with the practitioner in tutoring recognition because they would have to uh, reflect on and evidence the fact that they are working to the standards. So as somebody that's very new to the role, may not be in a position to, to apply, but I think that that in itself gives it a value because it's about saying that we, we are working to a standard and that's what, we, that's what we're, we're trying to achieve. So if we just look here at the, uh, the breakdown of it, what we've got here is, um, the three, uh, sorry, the four sections and then where those occupational standards fit within each section. And it's basically, it's a, it's a portfolio based um, recognition. People reflect on each aspect of the occupational standards within the context of their own role. And, and then they look at areas for improvement and how they might improve. So what we're doing is we're improving their actual practice through going through this process. Don't know if there's any questions or comments on that. I know there are a couple of people that are actually um, working on this at the moment within the pilot. Um, just just a, a point about the uh, applicability. I think just to stress that this is this that the the what you've just been describing can be applied in whatever context you operate in so it could be 16 to 18 adults working with the unemployed apprenticeships absolutely absolutely it is about you reflecting on your tutoring practice within the context of your role and then the we also looking now at the quality standard accreditation and, and this is very much a journey towards excellence. This is about supporting organisations to, to look in depth. It's that deep dive into tutorial provision. So although, you know, that there are certain standards out there that look across the board at your provision, what this one is doing is it's really focusing down on tutorial and those aspects of tutorial provision that, that are significant to impacting on learners. So within, within this, this kind of suite of, of standards, we've got supporting individual learning and development, uh, providing pastoral support and wellbeing, and delivering employability and enrichment opportunities. Now we've been going through um, a, a pilot phase for the last 18 months with this, and one of our colleges is, is, is nearing um, completion and submission, which we're very excited about. 
and the, the the feedback from the pilot is really quite positive in terms of it really does make you look at your provision in a different way it makes you speak to people that you wouldn't normally talk to about how things are linking in with other aspects of, of, of the college and it, it it also it enables you to identify and improve areas that you might not have previously considered so the three aspects to this practice and engagement management and coordination and continuous quality improvement but again this is all in the context of tutorial provision uh, just a question that relates to the individual oh yes uh, that's on the previous page mumtaz asks how long does the process take to complete at the first level this would be great cpd for tutors to complete and work towards yeah um the 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 amount of time that it's taking um we, we we're still ascertaining this really the the pilot we've got some organizations that they're actually encouraging their um their members to to complete within about four to six weeks but i think that's quite intense mm -hmm. i would say within six months mm -hmm. um you know and that wouldn't be putting too much pressure on on the individual um if they wanted to complete before that then fine but i i would say six months is reasonable thanks for that sammy thank you okay so Looking at the um, quality standard accreditation, these are some of the benefits that that, um, that you can get from this. Um, I, I'm trying to avoid this being a selling thing. It's not. It's, <laughs> it, this, is, this is about understanding how you can improve through, through a process. And the, there are different ways that you can do this. Now, for, for this particular standard, we we take people through the process together it's a collaborative activity um where you'll get um, a, a consultant that acts as a, as a critical friend and takes you through the process but one of the things that you will be able to do is, is be able to reflect on all of this through your initial review for your self-assessment for preparing for inspection and and to improve quality uh, across the board within your tutorial um, and then your accredited organizations will will receive um, the the logo that you can use um, you'll be acknowledged at the at the conference and at the website and I think it's a really good thing to be able to say that that you have reviewed your tutorial provision and and that you support your learners well um, the accreditation is, is valid for three years and there's a brief annual statement that's required just to just to continue that accreditation for those for those years in between and asks uh, how do we join the pilot um the, the the pilot is just coming to an end now so the pilot will be closing shortly i'm afraid so the, the you know we're, we're at a stage now where we, we've done our development we've done our reviews and um, people will be completing in the next few weeks so the, the pilot phase is, is now closing that was open to members um about 18 months ago okay so um just looking in a little bit more detail you'll obviously have these slides to review and if you want any further information about these then then please um please let me know i can send you some more some more information but th this is looking at um the three areas and how they differ um you don't have to do all three there might be one that that you feel is really important to you as a college and something that you know you 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 promote as being you know, a key part of your mission so it might be that that you know your your support for individual learners is particularly important to you and therefore you might like a, a standard accreditation in that so these are the the three areas that that you might like to consider 
And so just final thoughts, really. I, I think we need to encourage in terms of improving quality of tutorial provision, we need to really encourage honest and rigorous monitoring and, and review of, of our provision. Um, it's not enough just to look at what we do, but we need to look at the impact of what we do and where it's not working, to be honest about it. Um, to create effective communication at all levels. And I think this is particularly important where we might not have see, senior management buy-in for tutorial. And we usually feel that through the resourcing of that provision. To get all teams working collaboratively and to generate a professional dialogue. Now, this is one of the reasons why I set FETN up in the first place, was to be able to, to share our ideas and to identify where tutorial wasn't working, what the blockages to quality were, and to be able to work together to develop that. And that is one of the reasons why the quality standard and the professional tutoring recognition came about it was it was through talking to members about what what do we need to both raise the profile and to help to improve the the, the quality of this provision um, we also need to understand the relationship between quality of tutoring and students progress and achievement um, and and i think it's really important for us to be able to state that clearly uh, when we're trying to argue our case for resourcing and also to understand the relationship between the quality of tutorial support and student retention, which is one of the things that that um, Beach highlighted very nicely in that um, finance um, slide. So I, I would say that, that these are key things that we still need to work on. Okay, so any comments, questions? A quick final question from Paul. In terms of group tutorial delivery, yeah. do institutions, training providers, use standardised differentiated resources? Okay. Um, I think I think some some colleges do. Um, I'm not sure that in all cases they're differentiated. Um, FETN at the moment is, is working on developing these resources for members. Um, and there are some that, that you can access through the, the members portal for the, um, from the resource bank. But I think, I think generally one of the problems is color individual colleges will develop their own stuff and it's and it's not shared well enough um maybe maybe we could we could set something up where people can share this more we do it we do it through the resources like i said through the resource bank but um i don't know if there are any um who, who is it that's asking it can we can we set up some some contact between people here that might like to share between themselves and well i'll just ask if, if paul wants to directly contact you you'll have your details yeah yeah do that. So. yeah yeah happy to share anything we've got that will be useful but i think it, i think it's a good question and, and, and a good question i think dave also has said it's good to catch i think we need to catch up a bit on some of these things but it's a good question because that was one of the issues i had when i was an interim introducing mm -hmm. Um, you know, a, a new tutorial system in, in a different, uh, it was in a different country actually, was that, that that was the danger. We went for a bank of materials and we didn't spend enough time looking at the, what, you know, what was the appropriate level yes. for, for example, our foundation learners compared to our level three learners. We yes. want to cover the same content, but we needed a different way of doing it. And that was more appropriate to those different learners. And ultimately quite a lot of the learners told us that they thought some of the materials were inappropriate they were set at too high a level or too low a level. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So I, I think there's yeah. a need. And also there was difficult to glean what the learning was from some of those, particularly online, when we're doing things like uh, citizenship and uh, things like poverty, uh, yeah. health and safety. You know, sometimes you're, you're glad just to get the resource, but is it the most appropriate resource? And has it been tested 
in terms of things like, you know, is it appropriateness to certain ages yeah. or certain, for example, cultures. So but it's a very good, good point. Yeah. And, what, and whatever happened to experiential learning, you know, so much has gone online. Um, yeah. We, you know, we need to be looking at different ways of working as well and, and getting back to some of those. Um, and it'd be useful that, again, I think. I think that also is uh, developing that community of practice. That's what Dave's talking mm. about in terms of, you know, doing some of the things that you've talked about and implementing them across a group of colleges supporting each other. So I yeah. think that's what we really want to encourage. And there's one other question. Um, what, what's, what's the average time set aside for tutorials across different colleges? I think that's something that FETN have been doing for years is collecting that information, haven't you? And, and the problem is that it's like shifting sand, Beej. It, it, um, it, it's really difficult to say. I mean, in, in, as I said, we, we've got a lot of situations where the, um, the group tutorial and the one-to-ones are coming together. So time's been reduced down there because, the, you know, they're getting one hour instead of two a week. Um, we've got... Um, the majority that I know of do about 15 minutes individual tutorial per term with their learners. And if you think about that, if you think about the complexity of, of you know, learning as a whole and learning as a journey and an experience, and you think about um, that 15 minutes, it's not much of a conversation to be having about something that's that's so significant. So, um, well, Rebecca yeah. asked uh, Rebecca asked a really good question. I know we're we're finished now in terms of the presentation, but but Rebecca asked a question for those of us remaining, thirty five of us remaining. How much time do we give on average just for the group tutorial per week? Is it an hour or is it forty five minutes? Just give us some quick uh, responses if that mm -hmm. helpful, Sally. Yeah, that would be really good. So I'll get some responses. This is the group tutorial, one hour. Thank you. We've got a fair number saying one hour. One hour, one hour. That seems a common model, doesn't it? Yeah. One, one and a half hours, thank you. Wow. And is that just for group tutorial, that one and a half hours? You know, that one, well, one response says that includes one-to-ones have got to be fitted into that group tutorial. Ah. Uh, uh, 40 minutes. Wow. One hour, 40 minutes. On average, it's 45 minutes for group and 45 minutes for one-to-ones. 90 minutes, uh, uh, 60 minutes, but only 30 minutes for level three learners. That's an interesting differentiation, isn't it? Ooh. Group tutorial, one and a half hours. Group tutorial, one hour. 45 minutes group, 15 minutes individual. Group tutorial, one and a half. We've got fair, a fair range there from 45 yeah. minutes, 40 minutes up to... 90 minutes that's 90 minutes for a group tutorial 40 minutes group 15 minutes one-to-ones that seems quite common 20 minutes individual i take it that's a week not a year <laughs> um thank you for that oh yeah that it, one one person's answered 15 minutes six times a year it's a bit like my right. model yeah, one-to-ones take place every week with expectation every learner's had a one-to-one -one within every six weeks. So that's that's the model. Increasing tutorial hours to two hours for T-levels transition course. That's the level two program uh -huh. uh, that prepares people for obviously a level three T-level. So I think that's interesting to see interesting. how you manage to get the two hours there. Um, uh -huh. 15 minutes, six times a year with career coach and same, but with tutor. So what an interesting question. It certainly opened up all kinds of <laughs> discussions. Uh, timetables usually just collapse for a day to get through all young learners. So that's the ILP reviews. Thank you, Mumtaz. So, I, I mean, we'll keep, obviously, we've got copies of these responses, but really thank you for, Sally, for giving us, I think, a real good insight into how we can improve the quality of tutorial provision, not just for the, you know, inspection, for all the other reasons that we have, want to improve quality, it's not just in order to to satisfy the requirements of the inspection framework. Given us frameworks, given us standards, and given us a quality assurance approach, I think all of those are absolutely critical. And hopefully, from today, you'll be able to sort of build some of this in to your approach to next year and beyond. 
there's some future events there, Sally. Yeah, yeah, we've got the um, the quality standard accreditation is is, is being being launched, and uh, the offer for that will end on the first of September. We've got the outstanding personal tutor award nominations again this year. The closing date for that is the seventeenth of September. Um, if anybody wants to nominate a colleague for that, you can go on the FETM website and download the, the form for that. Um, the professional recognition scheme is going to be launched in the autumn. We're just going through pilot at the moment. And um, if, if anybody still wants to do the professional tutor recognition scheme pilot, um, there's room for a couple more. If you would like to do that, get in touch with me. And then, of course, we have our FETN annual conference, which this year is on the 19th of November in Sheffield. And we've got an early bird out at the moment. Um, so if you want your discounted price on that, you need to book by the 2nd of July. And again, the details are on the FETM website for that. So for, for Mumta's benefit, if, he, if they're interested in introducing that professional tutor recognition scheme, you can get in touch with you to be involved in maybe that pilot. Yep, yep, yep. Please get in touch and uh, and we'll have a chat about that. Not a problem. Brilliant. Thanks very much then, Sally. We're well past the time now, but we're so Sorry. pleased that, uh, you know, we've got over 30 of us still on this on the session. Uh, we will certainly get copies of the recording and the slides to everyone. So don't worry about that. And particularly to those that haven't been able to attend the live session, we will. If you've got any additional questions, then you can pose them to us. Sally, thanks for another excellent presentation. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Marek, to the technical side. Marek, you can send copies of the, the different responses to that question to Sally, so she's got a little bit more data. Yeah, no problem. And thanks to everyone for the questions and the comments. We really appreciate uh, the, the, the community of learning that we've established over the last few months working with Sally and FETN. Thanks, everyone. Sally? Yes, thank you for joining us. Uh, if there's anything you you need to know that you want to follow up on, then please let me know. If you feel that I can help in any way uh, with your tutorial improvements, then then please drop me a line. I'd be very, very happy to hear from you. Can you put up your last slide just to, to remind people of where they can get in touch with you? There you are. Oh. That's it. Thank you very much then, everyone. Thanks, Sally.